Hi, I'm Dr. Matthew Norton of People Plus Purpose, and this is the Truth Behind Dentistry podcast. And today I am excited to be joined by Dr. Pamela Maragliano Muniz. Dr. Maragliano Muniz was a dental hygienist before earning her DMD from Tufts University School of Dental Medicine and her certificate in advanced prosthodontics from UCLA School of Dentistry. She is a board certified prosthodontist, the chief editor for Dental Economics, co-host of the podcast Dentistry Unmasked, chief development officer for Celerant Consulting Group, and maintains a private practice in Salem, Massachusetts. And somehow she's managed to uh, be available for us today, which we're excited about. Uh, she lectures internationally and is extensively published. Her passion for prevention has stayed with her throughout her career. And in 2010, she was awarded the 2010 Adult Preventative, Preventive Care Practice of the Year by the American Dental Association. Welcome to the podcast, doctor. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. It is my pleasure. I've been looking forward to this. Many accomplishments, and I love the varied nature of all of that. I'm imagining somehow that each of these different elements touches different places in you in terms of in terms of being a, a journal editor, and that's not often in the bios when I'm introducing, so, but... Uh, I always find that it, it it makes for an amazing wealth of elements to contribute when people have had so many of those different experiences. Uh, I know we're going to, we kind of had decided to go in a direction or at least begin in the direction of considering hygiene uh, and kind of explore the the general relationship maybe these days between hygienists and dentists. So what what can you share about how you see that these days? It's not great, I would <laughs> say. <laughs> I mean, I would say in general, it's pretty strained. You know, I feel like I see both sides. You know, obviously, hygienists have been fighting for since, I mean, since before I was in dental hygiene school, you know, for, you know, to be respected and to be looked at as a co-therapist and be looked at as you know, something more than just one of the, you know, quote unquote, girls into the practice, um, you know, or girls on the team or whatever. Um, and I feel like from a dentist perspective right now, dental hygienists are, you know, they're not that many around, you know, obviously many of us are looking to round out our team and the wage demands are sometimes unrealistic, you know, in some cases, and they put a tremendous strain on a dental practice, especially if the hygienist hasn't progressed with what they're doing. You know, dental hygiene and the practice of dental hygiene in some instances hasn't changed for the better part of a century. Mm -hmm. And so if you're still practicing the same way you went to dental hygiene school and kind of doing things that aren't really productive, how is a dentist supposed to support the wage demands of the hygienist? It's just, it's just not a reality for all practices. And so it's challenging and it's stressful and it clearly impacts the relationship. So how did, how do you feel like we got here? I mean, this has been, as you say, a long standing, maybe less discussed, less overt. It seems like COVID if, and if, or it's many different, facets seem to accentuate the gap or change coming back from COVID, the way people are looking at working opportunities and wage, et cetera. But this has been an issue for a long time. So how do you feel like we got into this dilemma? I think this, this strain has been there all along. However, for a long time, there's been way more hygienists than dentists. And there's also been, you know, dentists had the pick of the litter when it came to hygienists because mm -hmm. there were more hygienists than there were opportunities. And with so many hygienists leaving the workforce, all of a sudden the tides have turned and now hygienists are in a position of power, if you will. And so now all of a sudden they're like, Hey, you know what, if you want me, you're going to have to pay me. You're going to have to, you know, give me the flexibility that I'm looking for, or I'm going to hit the road. And I think that that's almost exacerbating the problem in a way, but maybe if 
we treated them better from the get go, you know, maybe and gave them what they needed professionally and from a safety perspective or for whatever the reason was that made them leave the workforce, maybe we would have hung on to a few more hygienists and maybe they wouldn't have left. So yeah. I don't know. I mean, obviously 20, you know, looking back, you know, you can say with, you know, 2020 goggles, right. But you, you know, I don't, I mean, it's been going on for a long time. I'm pretty sure that because of this shift in the relationship, and now dentists are, you know, in a position where they're getting hurt financially by this. I don't see this getting any better, but it would be great if we could figure out a way to work together, you know, from both parties' perspectives a little bit more realistically, but also effectively. At the end of the day, it's about the patient, you right. know, and obviously about the practice. Right. I mean, you may feel how you want from a personal perspective, but if you want your practice to thrive, you need to have a great hygienist there. I mean, that's at least my opinion. Yeah. No, that's good. Where did the hygienists go? What what are they doing? What did they decide to do instead? Those who didn't just say ask for more pay and stay. What what where did they end up going from your perspective? And why primarily? I think a lot of them retired. I think there's a fair bit that retired. And I think there's some hygienists that maybe had a, just a professional change and maybe they're not practicing hygiene anymore. Maybe they're doing something else as a job. And maybe some of them took industry roles and, you know, kind of stepped away from the clinical role. And I think that that could have happened for many different reasons. I know, at least for me, and I would have, you know, imagine for many people, at least as an American, I've never had three months off, like since mm. I was in what grade school when you have the summers <laughs> off, like yeah. I haven't had that much time off in a long right. time. And that gave me an opportunity to reflect on a lot of things, my life, my practice, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm sure everybody felt similarly. And I think that, you know, for me in my practice, I realized I wasn't really happy with how my practice was operating. And my practice, the vision I had for my practice and the reality of my practice were not aligned at all. And during that time, I decided to make some major changes mm -hmm. for my practice. Mm -hmm. So if I went through that, I'm sure everybody went through that to some degree and maybe decided to say, you know what, forget it. I have to care for my family member. That's what's important to me. Or you know what, my back and neck have been killing me for years. And it doesn't hurt anymore since I haven't been hunched over somebody 40 hours a week. Maybe right. this isn't for me anymore. So I think it's a personal decision. And I think a lot of people made it wherever they went. I'm not sure, but they're they're not here. Yeah, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> However we got there. This is So for, for those, not that this would be a commercial for hygienists, and I'm not sure how many prospective hygienists would be watching us, but- what would you say in terms of how to better bridge the gap, work better together between doctor and hygienist? And what what might from either side might you say that that could inspire the doctor to reach across more and more and make that relationship more productive, more meaningful in, for the patients or for the benefit of the practice, but also maybe even have more people go, maybe hygiene is actually something I would want to get into because of certain opportunities. So it was a long question, but from both sides, what would you say? So for starters, I think that we have to look at dental hygienists differently. And I think we should, and actually somebody yesterday um, said it this way, and I just think it was so poignant the way that she said it. She said, dental hygienists should be considered the nurse practitioner of dental care, mm. not the janitor. Mm. And so if you are a janitor and you have that janitor mindset that you're just in there to like clean teeth and there's nothing else about this that's beneficial to the patient, then, you know, maybe, and maybe that's the vision of the practice and okay, cool, that's fine. But if you want a nurse practitioner of the mouth, and they're and the hygienists are really well suited to promote oral systemic health. Yes, yes. And yes. even from the practice, you know, for me as a restorative dentist, you know, I need my patients to be healthy so that I can treat them and have better outcomes. So there's certainly 
a win-win from very many perspectives to do that. I think we have to give them the autonomy to do what they're trained to do and what inspires them and what made them become a dental hygienist. So I think that maybe our perception from a dentist perspective has to change. And I think the hygienist perspective has to change. Like you can't be the janitor, but expecting, you know, payment like a nurse practitioner. I mean, you have to be able to understand a little bit about the business and understand what challenges the practice has and see if, you know, if what you're bringing in can, you know, and the wages that you're asking for are aligned because there's only a finite amount of money that comes into the practice. You can't just pay these crazy wages just because it's that not, it's just not a reality for a sustainable business plan. So I think the perception is there. I think also we have to invest in our team. I think a lot of us, I mean, I did it for years where I felt like it's important for me to be the best dentist I can for my practice. And mm -hmm. therefore I'm going to take these expensive hands-on courses. I'm going to buy the best materials. I'm going to take the appropriate amount of time that I need to treat my patients. Yet dental, the practice of hygiene, like it's probably exactly the same as it was like hand scaling with crappy instruments and rubber cup polishing with coarse, coarse profi paste. Like you're not getting patients healthier that way. If you look at perio prevalence rates. I mean, they're, they're abysmal in this country. They really, really are. I mean, upwards of 50% of Americans over age 30 have periodontitis. 75% of all adults have gingival inflammation. And if you have inflammation in your mouth, that inflammation is going to transcend itself into the body. Right. And so we have to make the unacceptable unacceptable. And, and we need to coach our patients properly, but we have to give our team the tools. In my practice and what's worked for me and what's changed my practice mm -hmm. um, altogether is bringing in the concept of guided biofilm therapy mm -hmm. into the practice. That has been an absolute practice changer um, from the perspective of hygiene engagement, patient engagement, office production. I mean, it's just changed everything. And it's, there's nothing new really about it. Some of the, you know, the technology might be a little bit new, but the concepts aren't new. The concepts of getting rid of biofilm dates back to the late seventies. It's not a new concept, but we now have technology that allow us to do that efficiently and effectively, ergonomically and economically. Right. And, and, you know, and we have that ability to do it. We just have to invest in our team and also attract the right team member. So sometimes what comes first, the chicken or the egg, have the great hygienist that you invest in or have the great tools and systems in place that will attract the great team. So I feel like it could work either way, depending on the practice and what the needs are. That's very good. I liked so much of what you said there. Um, one thing that stood out is yes. I mean, how rewarding ultimately would it be even to be a high paid janitor right? Is that really what the highest end that anybody's hoping for from a career perspective? But also, I've often thought that hygienists were that liaison in many ways, had the potential to be that from an oral systemic health perspective, because I, I think the siloing of dental practices apart from a larger healthcare community However, we got there. I mean, the idea that teeth are just kind of some, you know, structures that are not somehow connected to the well being of the rest of the body. But uh, to be able to be that health and wellness ambassador to some greater degree. And I think there's a lot of different ways, tools, assessments. Uh, ways that that can occur and even to see greater connectivity into the larger healthcare community and whose role is that in a dental practice, right? Who has the role of, you know, and some practices think I don't need it from a, I don't need to do that from a business success standpoint, especially if we're in network insurance, for example, but for people who choose not to be, I think it becomes even more critical from a business standpoint, but 
But to me, I think all of that has in common a loftier vision of possibilities, right? And that's kind of what I was hearing you say there, that we need to see bigger and then train for bigger, equip everybody for bigger. So thoughts on any of that or what would you add to that? I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think that, you know, one thing I think we have to remember when it comes to our relationships with any sort of insurance company or third-party payment, even though we may be in network, the relationship is really the insurer and the insuree. We're sort of like playing a conduit there. Right. And what they cover and what the patient may need might not align. Right. And so I think that when we treatment plan based on what their coverage is, we're not we're doing a disservice to our patients. And especially when, if you take the science, like for example, biofilm. Biofilm takes three months to become mature and can be quite virulent in about three months time. So if you're just so stuck on this six month profi and they're coming in every six months, even if it's like clockwork and they're a great patient, you're always chasing disease. You're always chasing that mature biofilm why not just have them in for one more hygiene visit or two more hygiene visits in the year? And I think that there's this, I don't know, like a barrier or something where patients are like, oh, I don't know, it's not covered. But if they understand what that looks like, some of them don't have any clue right. what a hygiene visit costs. And when we tell them, they're like, oh, that's it? It's not even that big a deal. They're not coming in for x-rays on that appointment or an exam on that appointment. It, they're in with the hygienist. And when they hear it's, you know, whatever your fee is, it's not always that shocking. I think they think because they don't, they are, you know, when they're thinking insurance, they're thinking about medical insurance and how medical bills are so crazy expensive and they might have this copay and they see how much their medical insurance saved them they think dental fees are similar to that and they're clearly not right. and so i think it's all about perspective and creating value and if you have a team that doesn't feel valued and they don't feel empowered they don't feel motivated they're never going to be able to feel inspired to create value for the patients to ultimately get them healthy but the reality is this, Americans are not healthy. Like we're just not like there's so many systemic illnesses that are plaguing Americans. And there's so many systemic illnesses that are exacerbated by poor oral health. And in general, we're not orally healthy either. Mm -hmm. And so we have a job to do. You know, it's a responsibility right. for us to convey this information to our patients. And it starts at the first second of that appointment, reviewing their medical history. It's not just about deciding if they need an antibiotic or not prior to their, their care appointment. It's about, let's see what conditions you have that are going to put you at risk for, you know, oral disease and vice versa. And so I think if we're looked at as, you know, a hygienist is being looked at as a the nurse practitioner of the mouth and dental care in particular is looked at part of your overall wellness and healthcare overall well-being, I think we're going to see people get healthier. And I think that's extraordinarily exciting. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. I love your perspective on all of that. I think that that's, that is what is needed. And I, in, in for a lot of clients that I coach, I know that one of the things that is uncovered fairly quickly is the challenge in chasing hygiene appointments trying to get people rescheduled or having filling the schedule when they cancel, which to me has always been reflective of the fact that they didn't really understand what was going to occur, why it was needed in the first place. So we're just calling them to try to get them on a schedule with no clarity as to why this is that important. So yes, it's how it's not not expensive. But even if it's free, but and I don't understand why this is actually meaningful for me, then why am I coming, right? So I think there's huge educational opportunities, which is why I appreciate your your education involvement, because I think that's so much the answer to break through a lot of these places of being stuck. I think also creating responsibility and accountability from the patient's perspective. So what we do in my practice and what seems to work really well um, my hygienist books their appointment. 
their next appointment with them. Mm -hmm. So the hygienist is, you know, deciding mutually with the patient if this is going to work. They've explained already why they need to come back in two, three, four, whatever months. Mm -hmm. And then the hygienist inherently says that appointment is with me. Like you're looking that person in the eyes and you're scheduled with me. So it's not like you're booking an appointment online with just like anybody, you know, and it's just, it's like, not like this abstract appointment. It's like, I know you, I care about you. I want to see if our intervention today is getting better or if what I recommended for you is actually working what you're doing at home. I need to see you in three months to, to check on you. Guess what? They don't cancel, but you have to create that value. And a relationship. I mean, there was a connection there too. So connection, good connection, good communication, good education. And that then I think sets up for the influence, the power of the influence to be able to, to follow up. So um, as we wrap up, what else have you been doing? What else might you want to share about your successes? What else has worked for you? That being one thing there. Um, what else has made your practice thrive amidst a lot of these obstacles, including the hygienist uh, availability challenge? So I feel like proud and guilty at the same time. Can you have that those two feelings Thanks. when it comes to my hygiene department? Because I went from in 2019, I went from a two day, two and a half day a week one hygienist practice. So one hygienist that worked two and a half days a week. That's what I had. And that's what that practice had for a long time, even prior to me coming in. And when I brought guided biofilm therapy and an empowered hygienist into my practice, same exact schedule initially, that hygienist brought in $84,000 more that year. And without anything different other than trying to get patients healthy. I didn't hire her saying, look, man, you're a hired gun. You need to start selling things. This isn't even about dentistry. I'm just talking about hygiene. And so that was comparing 2021 to 2019. Obviously 2020 doesn't count, right? right. So here we are in 2024 and I now have four hygienists. They're all part-time. They all work the schedule that works for them because we now have to be flexible as business owners, right? I can't dictate their schedule. They sort of have to work it out for themselves. I have hygienists that commute an hour to me. Each of them can have an hour commute about. And I also have hygienists that when I'm ready, they'll quit their job and join me if I ever have an opportunity for them. And I really think it's about autonomy and empowerment, and value, and appreciation, and culture, and all of these things that we never had to care about before 2020. Now, if you can do it, and you can create a cohesive team, I've got people that are just like waiting to come in. And from a practice management perspective, which again, this is not my driving force, but we all have to use metrics and you know, production is a metric. Right. We've quadrupled hygiene revenues since 2019. And just yesterday, I had my office manager run the first half of the year since we're almost there now. And we're on track to 5X. I don't, wow. is it quintuple? Like, is that a word? Like, yep. to, I'm yep. going to quintuple my. <laughs> so, 5X in five years is what we've got going on. And I don't, I don't have somebody telling me what to do. I don't have, you know, I, I, I really, it's just, I want to provide the best care and I want my team to, do the same. And for me, it started with having a really heartfelt mission, having a vision, having people that align with that, but also trusting them and giving them the ability to just do what they do and do what they do well. And I couldn't dictate that even if I wanted to. That's awesome. You were speaking the people plus purpose love language there. That was, uh, <laughs> I felt really affirmed in that response because that's what I love to do. I love to help practices be able to get breakthroughs so they can create more of that because, I mean, as you know, I mean, so many are, I think so many dentists were not only didn't 
learn enough about business in school, but they didn't learn anywhere to be leaders of people. And now suddenly there's a bunch of people that they they're in a leadership role with and don't know what to do. And so I love helping get breakthroughs in those areas. And so I, I, I love the fact that you're seeing that and stating that to be such a priority, like team first. If you want the greatest impact with patients, I always feel like invest in the team at a higher level that will then you'll have a, an army of people spilling over that greater value to the patients. I couldn't agree more. And I feel like I trust them. You know, I, I don't have to micromanage any aspect of the hygiene part of the practice in any way, shape or form. I go in and ask them what their recommendations were and they're sound. I stand by what they're doing because our goals are aligned. And what has that done for me as a practice owner is I'm working on healthier patients. Yeah. There's nothing worse than a worse than a bloody class two or trying to make final impressions on you know this edematous, spongy, bloody, yucky, oozy gingiva, mm. you know, or trying to deliver crowns on tissue that's unhealthy. You know, the only negative, if you want to call it a negative, is it's harder to pack cord now. That's the only negative wow. <laughs> with what I've got going on. Otherwise. My patients are healthy. I, my periodontist just today texted me. I have a big case that I'm working on with him. And he's like, I can't believe how great her tissue looks. It looks awesome. And I'm like, it's because we prioritize the fact that these are biofilm mediated diseases. And, you know, we're, we're working and doing our part to get and keep our patients healthy. And it makes my job so much easier and so much more rewarding. That's great. Well, congratulations. I I just want to say I'm proud of you for all that you've accomplished, all that you're doing and the value you're bringing to a team and and the fact that people want to find a home there in your practice. That's that's extremely meaningful. That's that's a that's a great compliment to what you what you're creating. So, I really appreciate the opportunity for us to talk today. This has been a, a, a very enjoyable conversation, but I think there's been a lot of value for those people that are that are watching. So, appreciate your time in that. Pleasure's mine. Thank you so much. I appreciate the invite and I love this conversation because if I can help anybody even get a step closer to loving dentistry as much as I do, then I've done my job. That's great. So for those people who say, yes, I, I have been moved by what Dr. Pam has, has said, uh, if they wanted to reach you, learn more about what you're doing or what would be an appropriate thing? What would you like people to do if they wanted to engage with you further? Well, don't hesitate for starters. I feel like sometimes people feel like, oh, you know, I've, I've seen her on a stage or I've, you know, see her in the magazine or whatever. And I feel like in some ways it makes people feel like they can't reach out. And that's truly not the case. I'm like a person, just like anybody else. I'm in my practice four days a week. Like I get like all the things that we're doing. So don't hesitate to reach out to me. Instagram's great. Cause it's kind of all in one place. So at Pamela, uh, actually no at Dr. Pamela underscore Maragliano. Um, you can email me, um, as well at um, P Muniz, M U N I Z, at Endeavor B to B dot com. Um, but Instagram is probably the easiest place. So, again, don't hesitate. I'm happy to help. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you again. I appreciate the time and your contribution and uh, look forward to uh, having another conversation with you down the road. I would love that. Thank you so much. Absolutely. So for everybody uh, watching, uh, this is Dr. Matthew Norton with People Plus Purpose. I've been with Dr. Pamela Maragliano Muniz, and uh, we just appreciate you spending time with us. I trust that you found value and hopefully you'll reach out to her. Please subscribe to the podcast so we can uh, kind of encourage uh, more great guests like her to, to join and be a part of it. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thank you.